Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. For those of you that are with us, have been with us for the last couple of years, today we're, our journey is just a little different. We're going to talk about the Democratic Party of Hawaii, which, of course, has been since we have been a Democratic Party of Hawaii since, what, April 30, 1900. However, my guest today, don't go back that far, today we are going to talk to Richard Port, which most of you know, and Richard is not old enough to have been with us in 1900, and Tracy Takano, of course, everybody in the union knows Tracy, and then our live wire, Bart Dane. Bart is the live part of the Democratic Party. Oh, <laughs> that sounds like you're jinxing me, a little bit of bocce. No, but, <laughs> but first, Richard is a former chair of the Democratic Party and really breathed life into the position of the chair. Up to that point, I don't even remember who they were or since then, you know, but Richard was alive and doing things and made the party exciting and Tracy and Bart were part of that. So we want to talk today about that part of the party. So Richard, tell us about Richard. When did you come to Hawaii? I came in 1967 and uh, attended, not as a delegate, but as a guest, the 1968 uh, convention. Uh, Patsy Mink was running Bobby Kennedy's uh, presidential campaign, and we were allowed to walk in and walk right out again uh, with signs for Bobby Kennedy. But my first the real convention was 1980, and uh, one of the things that I feel most satisfied about in that 1980 convention, we did something that everybody was telling me at the time we could not do. We changed the rules of the party to require that half of the delegates beginning in 1982 would be women. And uh, that happened. And uh, eight years later, in 1990, uh, we were able to change the rules so that half of the leadership of the Democratic Party would be women. And uh, probably uh, that's what I feel most satisfied about. Well, let me just tell you this little caveat. I live in East Honolulu, and at that time when you made the change, all of the, uh, the district chairs, everybody in East Honolulu was a woman. And so sisters said, we've got, what do you mean? We're already women. So now we've got to give up a seat for a man, you know, so. That's true. Yep, that, that was true. That's true. That actually happened. <laughs> uh, and... Um, Initially, uh, there was not a big problem with half of the delegates uh, to the convention uh, being women, but when we came to the change to make half of the leadership, it went down in 88, and, but it was revived in 1990 with a, a swell of about 20 women standing behind the microphone and only one or two men standing the, uh, in opposition. <laughs> so it passed uh, overwhelmingly. Yes. So now, as chair, no, it was before you became chair. That's when you two show up in the Rainbow Coalition. So tell us about the Rainbow Coalition. Well, um, the Rainbow Coalition of Hawaii. Yeah, the Rainbow Coalition of Hawaii started uh, when Reverend Jackson came here. He, he was going to uh, Korea. Uh, interesting, he was going to try to mediate something with North and South Korea. But on his way back, he stopped here and he uh, asked. Um, we could organize some events, so we did. And you know, um, when you when you bring somebody like Jesse Jackson, it's like everybody knows him. Everybody wants to help, and and it's, it's and, and good people and some people that just want to be around. So that's the first time I met Richard because Richard, we had an event. I forget which one it was, but so Richard came up and he introduced himself. And somehow, among all the people that um, came and said that, you know, they're the one, 
he really was the one. I mean, he <laughs> came up and he said he wanted to, to help run the, uh, be the chair for the campaign. And, um, and you know, he, he, through Richard's uh, guidance, um, we were able to register a couple thousand new members. Oh, goodness, right? yes. The numbers swelled, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of people so active. Mm -hmm. it's in 1988, Reverend Jackson got half of the delegates to, from Oahu mm -hmm. and slightly less than half of the delegates mm -hmm. uh, on the neighbor <laughs> islands. Uh, pledged to him and his presidential campaign. And I can still remember vividly uh, Governor Waihe coming into the Democratic headquarters that night and looking up at the board, which showed the results. And uh, Governor Waihe said, well, it just goes to show when the governor speaks, not everybody listens. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was the night, as I remember it, we were waiting on the results, and this was... Um, Jesse versus Dukakis, correct? Right. That's right. Yeah. And in the first congressional district, which is urban Honolulu, uh, Jackson was ahead at one point towards the end. There was one last precinct that hadn't reported its results. And I won't say who lived in that precinct or where it was located. Let's just say that, that there was a vote, a non-vote. A non-vote, yes. <laughs> yeah. Although we've never, we, we didn't fight we, that because we essentially we were getting half the delegates, yes. but uh, we, we didn't fight the... Uh, but but that, there, there is a tradition in the Democratic Party, you have to count the votes and you have to verify and you have to make sure that the count is accurate. And that was one night when it was a little <laughs> suspicious. Jesse was ahead and then one re results came in very, very late and then the other guy pulled ahead. That's right. Yes. Yeah, and but in, in good democratic form, we didn't challenge the last precinct. Yes. <laughs> well, no, we, still got the, we, we still got the number of uh, national delegates right. that we needed. But I re what I remember, because I didn't know a thing about the uh, Rainbow Coalition other than, I mean, locally, mm -hmm. until I got a call from Richard saying, we need somebody in your district. I said, I'm it. Okay. Count me in. Yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you that uh, Tracy Picano played a tremendous role in that campaign. And uh, all through the next uh, 10 years or so, played a, a great role in the Democratic Party to democratize the Democratic Party. <laughs> That's an interesting phrase, mm -hmm. democratize. Well, there are a lot of people. I mean, Richard brought a lot of new people in. Oh, he and, did. And really, um, true believers, so it, it, it helped the party. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, the thing about Richard is he didn't, Richard, you know, he wasn't about, he was about bringing more people in, but he wasn't about moving other people out. You know, he, he said, hey, as long as you're willing to work together, let's work together. Yeah, and the, I, I give him a lot of credit for that. I think, for me, there was more energy all around mm -hmm. with all these new people, and it was just a lot, that's what I'm saying about the, the energy, why we remember you as a chair, and I don't remember, I, I guess I could, if I thought about it, remember all the others. But One of the others was his, uh, his wife, Joan. Joan played a major role oh, in that yes. campaign, too. Yeah. But as you point out, there, there were others, uh, uh, without going into the name, but there were a lot of good oh, people. Mm -hmm. Yes. I and mean, uh, that was such a joy to be a part of the party. And this young man was my, uh, yes, was Central Committee man. I was originally elected on the Central Committee from, from Palolo when I lived in Palolo. And then you moved to uh, And that was Ina another Hunter. election. I ran against someone for that position who was an attorney who had worked in Inouye's office and was favored <laughs> by the old guard. And when the election results came back, that other person was announced as the winner. And I was going over to congratulate him, and then Tracy came running over to me and said, don't concede yet. They went and they counted the ballots, and there had been a clerical error. The votes that went to me were reported as going to him and vice versa. And so, again, it reinforces my skepticism that within the Democratic Party, there are people who feel the ends justifies the means, and it's important that their side win. 
So we have to have integrity in the election process, and that often requires safeguards and to ensure. I should add that that happened in 1980 on President, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Ted Kennedy's presidential campaign, where the person who ran as a delegate for uh, Kennedy uh, opposite me uh, was announced as the winner. And uh, there was a young um, a minister by the name of Ted Fritchell who um, went up and said, that can't be right, and went up and sure enough, they had reversed the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> well. So, accidentally, of yeah, course. Yes. But, you know, that's, we, we hear a lot about that. <laughs> uh, and I feel, though, after all these years, and I'm not going to say how long, but usually, usually, somebody does exactly that. Said, so, wait a minute, hold on, let's get it right. Mm -hmm. You know, as a rule. Probably Are you the, doubting it? I think, actually, there's a real struggle going on now. Um, we have to push back to make sure the Democratic Party is internally Democratic. Now, Richard was National Committee man at one point, in addition to being chair, and I'm National Committee man now, and when I went to the DNC, I was committed to a program of reform because the 2016 presidential election was very divisive. The, it, it was allegedly rigged for one of the candidates, and there was a lot of basis for that. So this time around, the new chair, Tom Perez, has dedicated himself to cleaning up the image of the DNC and has reformed a lot of things. But inside the local Democratic Party, there is a group of people who want to exclude the the newcomers, they want there to be barriers to their participation. Really? And yes, it's, it's, it's very powerful. It's, it, it, it happens everywhere. I mean, it, it happens in communist parties, it happens in democratic <laughs> parties, it happens in republican parties, it happens all around the world. Incumbents want to hold on to their power and they want to exclude newcomers. And we have to fight against that here. Now, we've mentioned a couple of times about national committeemen. What is a national committeeman? What, uh, what is a, it? It's a glorified title. Um, it, it, it's allegedly, it's like a senior statesman, or and there's a woman also, National Committee woman, and you are members of the DNC, which is the governing body at the national level for the, the Democratic Party. The DNC is the party, Democratic National, national committee. committee. And it sets policy, mm -hmm. uh, and at the head of it is the national chair, which right now is Tom Perez. Um, and the good so, news about that position is usually it is veteran people who have worked for the party for a for, period of years. Yes. And while it's, uh, Bart and I, I know, do not feel that uh, the, the National Committee is an is a absolute uh, good thing, it uh, does provide some experience to the National Party as to uh, what's going on in the particular states. So, now, I remember Ariyoshi was, at one time, National Committee That's member. That's right. They've been... Uh, Several, but uh, in fact, John Wahey uh, was, was, and Russell Okada was. Russell Okada yes. was one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you now, as a committee, national committee, you go to D.C. to the meetings. Is that what happens, or yes. how yeah. does that work? Yes, uh, there's uh, usually uh, three or four times a year there'll be a national meeting, and you go to those so meetings. So all fifty states Same, show up. Yes. Fifty-seven states, we're saying now. Yeah. The, the territories. Puerto Rico. The territories, the yes. Democrats abroad. A yes. total of 57 parties. 57 and we, and we call people. them 57 state parties in, in the oh, DNC. Uh -huh. so and uh, it, uh, probably the most memorable one, and uh, if people watch this show, they will remember this. Uh, there was a famous meeting in, uh, when President Clinton was getting ready to run for his second term. And uh, he invited the uh, state uh, Democratic Party chairs to come to his Oval Office. And at the same time, there were a few other guests. One of them uh, turned out to be Monica Lewinsky. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was the early part before, before, yes. They show pictures of that one all the time, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I should say one more thing about Rainbow Coalition, because the high point of the Rainbow Coalition, I think, was as late as 1996, when everybody who was running to be state central committee person, man or woman, 
when they were running, they all went to the microphone and said, I am a member of the Rainbow, <laughs> Hawaii Rainbow Coalition. Mm -hmm. So Tracy did a good job. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But there was, yes, there was this time that I remember that if you were not a member of the Rainbow Coalition, it was to get elected as a delegate to the convention, you needed to do that. Well, the, the important part, of course, was we were all involved in making the party more progressive, uh, making it also ethically progressive. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't only about just being liberal policies. It was also about uh, doing the right thing. And um, I think that, uh, to me, that was a shining part of the Hawaii Rainbow Coalition. Yep. I, I don't remember the year, so you, you'll remember this, but Richard was on the phone. He called every, what is it, 52,000 members? Well, I didn't call all, but I, I tried. I, I must have called 12,000 members. He was on the phone talking to everybody that answered the phone. Right. And I would leave a message if they weren't. Uh, yes. Yes. And he asked them questions. It wasn't just, hello, send a donation. He actually asked questions, what, how they, what they wanted, how they felt about what was going on with the legislature. He really wanted to know what it was that was. And I, I would go up and, and uh, testify, and one rather senior uh, senator who still was on the, in the Senate uh, referred to me as a scold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we wanted them to do the right thing. Yes. And uh, that carries on today. I think uh, uh, I've written twice uh, this uh, legislative session in the Honolulu Star Advertiser uh, uh, indicating uh, my displeasure at uh, the way they've handled minimum wage. Right. Oh, that was the one you called the... Republicans. Republic those are, those yes. are Republicans who get themselves elected as Democrats. Yes, well, we know there's a lot of that. <laughs> Certainly some. Yeah, there's no way we could have 25 or 24 out of 25 people as Democrats if some of them weren't yeah. just cross over, put the D so they can get elected. I think what we need to do is uh, ask all of our citizens to ask questions when people come to their door wanting to be elected, well, how do you stand on this or that uh, and get an answer from them and a pledge from them that they will do something about some of the issues and the problems that we have in Hawaii? Now, what is the relationship between the Democratic Party, as, as we know it, and the legislators? You know, they, okay, so they sign it, they put a D next to their name, but what is, what's the connection, or is there a connection? Well, the, okay, they really don't get much from us. Um, so from their point of view, they got elected on the basis of their friends that helped them do campaigning, their relatives, their schoolmates, the special interests that fund them, or the unions that endorse them and provide volunteers. And all the party does is allows them to use the D next to their name, and the only time they hear from the party is when we're either going to ask them for a donation or one of our members has filed a complaint against them and wants to get them kicked out for not living up to our platform. So what we have to do is, I think the real challenge is find some way that actually they want to be on good terms with the Democrats that live in their district, if not with the statewide organization or the county organization, at least with those who are active members of the party in their district which calls upon us as Democrats to organize within those districts and make them vital so that if there are a dozen, just a dozen active party members in each house district and the uh, representative knows these people are monitoring the legislature and they care about the issues and they testify, but also they will stuff envelopes or do sign waving, that will incentivize, I think, the elected official to want to remain on good terms with the party people. So how, you mentioned districts. How many? How is the state divided? How many districts? House districts and Senate districts. Fifty-one. Fifty-one House. Fifty-one House districts. Twenty-five Senate districts. And Democrats are twenty-four out of the twenty-five senators. 
Um, and I think there are five Republicans? I think or, that's correct. No? So we, we, the problem is we dominate. And yes. so we are the party no longer of, of challenge and of change. We're the party of the status quo. And within the party, you've got a, a bell curve. You've got a spectrum of people's opinions. But in, in general, most of them try to line up with the leadership in, in both chambers so that they can get committee assignments, they can get capital improvement projects for their district, and they don't want to make waves. Oh, okay. So, and then we have, what, two congressional districts? Yes. Two. So it's urban Honolulu and the rest of the state, huh? Mm -hmm. It's CD2. Right. Yeah. And so... Those are always... Democrats. Those are always Democrats. Yeah. Since nineteen sixty. Uh, let's see. Um, well, we had a special election, and Charles DeJou was congressman mm -hmm. from the first seat because the two, Democrats yeah. split. For Essentially, a while. Uh, the two states that almost never elect uh, Republicans to Congress are Massachusetts and Hawaii. And so you are both. I've been both. Now you are originally from Massachusetts. That's correct, uh, and uh, I've. Uh, always voted uh, Democratic in both states, except the first time I voted, I did make a mistake, and I voted <laughs> for one Republican. <laughs> but I, that, that person will name, remain well, un, unnamed. Okay. So, but when did you come to Hawaii? 1967. And so as, What brought you to Hawaii? Uh, well, um, I, uh, I had a professor at Columbia University who took a liking to my wife and I, and uh, decided to invite us here to work for the university, well, for the Department of Education at the University of Hawaii. And uh, turns out uh, that was very fortunate for me. And the only other thing I would add to that is my dad played ukulele and guitar. <laughs> and uh, so we, he, he said one time, when I go out to Hawaii, well, he never lived to get here, but uh, I'm living his dream. Oh, it's, yeah. But so so you, Richard's not just a, from Massachusetts. He is a Kennedy, Irish, yes, Democrat, that. Yeah. And that, that whole Kennedy camp. And so he and his wife were the first married couple, right, who joined the Peace Corps. When That's correct. Yeah. Jack Kennedy put out the call for volunteers, they stepped up. It's, how old were you at the time? I was 23, and uh, they gave me uh, five days to get from Massachusetts, give up my job, and to give up her job. Uh, get rid of our furniture, uh, get rid of our rental apartment, and go to Berkeley, California. So that was an extraordinary event uh, to do the preparation and uh, got a send off at the Oval Office with President Kennedy. And where did you go in the Peace Corps? In Ghana, West Africa. And um, Wow, so you go from here, one side of the country to the other, and then back. And all the way to Ghana. Ghana. Yeah. How long were you in, in the Peace Corps? Two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, most satisfying years of our lives. Both of us believe they were the two best years of our lives. Well, we need to take a break, and then we'll come back and talk some more. We still have to talk about who you are. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Jane Sugimura, host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be Grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Aloha, I'm Marcia, and we're back. And we are talking to an illustrious group of Democrats. And see, now everybody that watches knows I'm a Democrat, so we. 
This is not something new. <laughs> uh, Richard Port is was the former chair. How many times were you chair? Twice. Twice. Well, once for two elections. Two elections. I believe I'm the last chair to be elected and then re-elected. I was convention. going to say, but didn't you stop and come back? No. No. Okay. Uh, I then became Democratic National Committeeman. Oh, okay. Tracy Takano as ILWU. Is that correct? Well, the union. Well, yeah, I, I work for the union, but I'm I'm just here representing. I'm just no, here as a no, no, I know, but old guy. But for for most of us, mm -hmm. that is the connection mm -hmm. to the union. That when you think ILWU, this is what we think of. And Bart, Bart's everything. <laughs> Bart is now the national committeeman. And he is the life of the party. Uh, no. <laughs> the party. no uh, There's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> yeah, there, and there are a lot of people who object to that. So, you know, one thing in the early, in the first part, we didn't talk much about Tracy because Tracy is actually a very modest person who does stuff silently and effectively. Right. Um, but he is effective. Behind the scenes. Yes. And, and I don't know how you can draw him into this discussion a little more because he knows an awful lot of stuff. One thing I would set it up it with, I think the Rainbow Coalition benefited in Hawaii uh, in its historical context. So there was a lot of social movements, community struggles that were going on during the 70s, particularly and into the 80s. And I know Tracy was rooted in that stuff. Yes. In particular, some of us benefit a lot from learning things through the Ethnic Studies Program and its commitment to engagement in the community. And I think that strengthened the and, work of the Rainbow Coalition and enriched and it. And prepaid health care. The unions were knee-deep mm -hmm. in getting us that. Well, that legislation was written in ILW Hall, so... Yes, yeah. and that's one of the things that now today's people have no idea what the unions did. Mm -hmm. But with the unions and and the legislature was both Democrat and Republican at that time, mm -hmm. and everybody worked together to get us a prepaid health care. So tell us more about what what does what does ILWU stand for? Let's start there. What does that mean? Well, right after I said I'm not here representing the union. No, but no, it, that's it, okay. It, but what? It's the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. So it started off um, in Hawaii. It was the, the union that organized the workers on the docks, the dock, dock workers. From there, it went to the um, sugar and pineapple plantations. And then it kind of uh, spread to a lot of different, because well, yeah, Hawaii is still small. So a lot of people, when they, um, when the union was able to really significantly help people on the plantations and the docks, then other, a lot of their friends, their family said, hey, you know, we, we need some, some help here too. So it, it grew into a lot of different uh, industries, tourism, hospitals, um, automotive. So it, now it's, it's really the, um, it's the largest private sector union in, in Hawaii. I would like to add one thing about ILWU. When uh, I came in 67, uh, we had to each year get funding for something called the Hawaii English Program. And we would be called down to ILWU headquarters prior to the legislative session to tell the committee why we should be funded. And uh, it was regarded as a very important event that we made sure that we were able to defend the programs that we were trying to get funded. So I, I have great admiration. Uh, and there was a, a man there at that time, no longer living, but Dave Thompson. Mm -hmm. And he would go up to the legislature for ILWU, and he would talk about the children of workers. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, uh, I was almost in tears when he would speak uh, so profoundly about the needs of the, our children of the workers in Hawaii. So. I have a great love for IOWU, and I might add that uh, when there was an effort to save the two newspapers here, and subsequently the two airlines, but in particular the two newspapers, the IOWU arranged for a meeting at which uh, I was asked, I was invited to attend. It was uh, held with uh, former Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Tom Gill, uh, former Lut uh, Lieutenant Governor Gene King, Aquan McElrath, the great, uh, the great Aquan, great yes. uh, uh, person in Hawaii, two or three others, 
And uh, it was that group that spurred the effort that initially was quite successful in saving the two newspapers. I remember you, though, really campaigning to save. They told, they, when I left the meeting, I left it early, and I got a call later saying, you're in charge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what happens when you leave her. But now <laughs> that's you, right. You, after the peace, uh, the peace Court, and you came to Hawaii, you were in the Department of Education for how long? Uh, 25 years. Oh, my. So I retired there. But in between time, I should mention that I also was in Nigeria for two years with the Agency for International Development. And uh, so I, part of my experience was, um, and my efforts, was motivated by what I saw both in the Peace Corps and in Nigeria. And um, uh, to me, the, uh, the, the need to do things for poor people and people who don't have others to, like, uh, you know, they're in some ways, workers, public workers and private workers are uh, often very uh, lucky to have unions here in Hawaii that can support their efforts to increase their wages. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it, the problem is the people at the very bottom don't have that and they require people like us and others to uh, go up there and uh, to try to uh, make the legislature make, you know, see that the needs uh, of these people. I remember when I first went to work for Brian Fossey, and you know, when you fill out all the paper, and then so they asked me if I was going to join the union. And I said, well, why am I going to join the union? And they said, well, whether you join or not, you get all the benefits that the union fought for. I said, yeah, put me down. I'll, you know, whatever the dues, yeah, put me down. <laughs> so, of course, you know, what else would I do? I knew there was a reason I like you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> of course, why so, not? So some of what Richard says is triggering in my, my brain is how do we overcome this dilemma of having the Democrats control almost all the legislative seats, but when something that affects working people like the minimum wage comes mm -hmm. along, it doesn't pass, it fails mm -hmm. to pass, and they represent the interests of corporations much more effectively than they do of working people. And I think what the Rainbow Coalition was trying to do in Hawaii was trying to draw people into, from the community, involved in their community, rooted in their communities, into the party and have the party become a vehicle for their demands, for their aspirations, as well as giving them practical skills so they could be more effective in influencing people getting elected and passing legislation. And that effort still has to continue. And I was it has getting, to be, that was my next question. Okay. What, how do we... Do that again, uh, because yes, everybody was upset about the fact that they got a pay raise and they couldn't raise the minimum wage. It it, it was just an incredible. I I don't understand what, how it is that we or not just Democrats but people, mm -hmm. ordinary people, and when they talk about the homeless, they never talk about. The fact that you're making ten dollars an hour and the rent rent is eighteen hundred dollars a month, they don't match. Yeah. So what? Why? What do we have to do to get people again, like the Rainbow Coalition, to, to come and really push the legislature? Well, obviously there are some good people who are members of the Democratic Party. They have to find a way to be able to step forward and really see this problem through. Uh, one of the efforts made this year that was uh, very sad was uh, the attempt to reduce the health care benefits of the people who were going to get an increase in the minimum wage. And that's what ended up uh, making it fail uh, for 40 years now. Uh, one of the great benefits that being a member of the Democratic Party has been to provide health care for all uh, our full-time workers. And uh, unfortunately, this year, the, the bill that got killed was attempting to reduce the, uh, the amount of an increase in the minimum wage uh, if a company provided health care. But it didn't affect legislators or government workers or, or uh, even uh, private uh, workers. And, but at only would affect the people that were getting an increase in the minimum wage. 
it really takes a lot of work. You know, we, when we organize uh, a lot of people into the um, Jackson campaign and into the Democratic Party, we, you know, we went, we're going, with, with the help of different people that were active in those communities, we went, went door to door in Waipahu and Eva and different communities mm -hmm. like that. And, you know, it was, the message was, you want to join the Democratic Party or even do you want to register to vote? But it's, do you, it was, you know, we're, we're here pushing for Jesse Jackson, that message of, of inclusion, somebody that's going to just gonna, uh, take up your fight. And the people that were going door to door were some of those people involved in those fights. So it's really, it takes a lot of work. And then it's, it's, the end goal is not to, you know, you, you spoke about people uh, saying, introducing themselves as members of the Rainbow Coalition when they gave their Central Committee speech. But it wasn't, that wasn't the goal to get people into uh, positions. But it was really to, we, we wanted the, the Rainbow, we wanted the Democratic Party to be a, um, a voice for people that were really locked out up to that point. And, and that's, I, I think the, the need is there, the, the desire is there, but people need to see a, a concrete um, vehicle to use to, to get to where they want to be. Well, we are, are we still, and this is to you, are we still divided between the Bernie people and the other people? Is there still a wedge there? There's a division within the Democratic Party, and it's inevitable in the Democratic Party, between those people who are more committed towards a uh, working class perspective and those people who are more interested in their careers, which are, are benefit from aligning the corporations and the lobbyists. And that is a permanent thing. In 2016, I felt it expressed itself. Richard worked for Clinton, supported Clinton, I supported Bernie, so we disagree on this. But it, it expressed itself around the personalities of Hillary Clinton and, and Bernie Sanders. But the fundamental underlying conflict is between a more progressive and a more corporatist sort of vision. The progressives have to root themselves more in regular working class people, though, to become effective. They cannot be mm -hmm. just sort of floating above and... What, the moment, what, is, a, what is the definition of a progressive? What, what is a progressive? I think it depends on who you talk to. I think it's, it's those people who believe that we have to make a society that is more small-d democratic, that serves the needs of, of the vast majority of people, uh, and the government can be a, an instrument towards that end. Uh, I think that's what a progressive is. I would say one word would be justice <laughs> for all. Mm -hmm. And um, we're not asking that uh, billionaires and millionaires don't make... People are going to, that, that's the part of the democratic system. Some people are going to make more money oh, yes. and are going to be richer. Mm -hmm. But at the bottom level, there has to be a sense of mm -hmm. justice. And uh, that's uh, not, even in Hawaii, as wonderful as Hawaii is, we're not there. Yeah, this morning's paper was scary about the, the depression of so many people. Yeah. Did you see this no. morning? No. And a headline, it, it, it's just to look at it, it's the people that are suffering. Yeah, right here, and we, we tend mm -hmm. to think this is paradise, yet there's a huge amount of people suffering. Ironically, what I think legislators may not totally understand is they're providing a lot of money, and I'm glad, for the homeless, but they're going to create more homeless unless they do something about people who work full time. Uh, and there's, there's a variety of solutions uh, to, the, to the issue of minimum wage uh, that, that it, it doesn't have to be exactly what, you know, uh, as I recall, uh, Sanders was for $17 an hour and Clinton was for $15 an hour. The point really is, how do you provide uh, adequate, uh, whether it's through tax system or through minimum wage or, in fact, other means? Uh, of, of providing for those who are working in our society but not uh, gaining the benefits. It's amazing. If, well, of course, you know, you don't have little children. I don't either. But you look at the cost of a box of cereal that little children love, and it's five, six dollars. You know, it's like, how Tracy has a daughter. That young? I don't think she's that no, young no, no. Does she Not have... young, but Not that young. as a daughter. <clears throat> yeah, but when you look at the cost, just the daily cost of mm -hmm. groceries, <clears throat> and you're making $10 an hour, $12 an hour, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, 
How do you do that? Well, what, what really the uh, legislature needs to do is go around and see what companies are currently paying. I can hardly find any company that's paying less than eleven twenty-five uh, now, and in and the ones that are at that level are usually restaurants. Yes. And restaurants, of course, the workers do get tips. So, uh, it, but if you look at other <coughs> kinds of businesses, they are paying more than that. So, to, to even think about and ten an hour is ridiculous. It is. It is. And. You know, you're right that if you look, even Zippy's is twelve dollars an hour with benefits. Right. They're ad. Right. With benefits. Right. But then Zippy's will always be Zippy's. You know, yeah. <laughs> it will always be there. So now, tell me, what are you going to do now that you have retired from the DOE, retired from the Democratic Party? Well, I'm not. Re- we never retired from the Democratic <laughs> Party. Just when you think you're up, I am. Yeah, you back yeah, I gotta say, just when you. I am as alive as can be uh, till the day I die. I will be a Democrat. Now, I won't say that I will never vote for a Republican, but it's probably very unlikely. Uh, but but that, that see the difference is that not all Democrats are good. That's right. I thought um, Bart said that. Uh, what I probably should uh, should say is that uh, when I was chair. Uh, people came to me to defend a couple of senators, and I said, hey, I'm not going to defend that kind of conduct. So I won't mention names here on the air, but there were a couple of instances. One was a male, one was a female, and both of them didn't win their next election. Now, I will tell this story. We only have a couple minutes. I was one of those, called Richard, and I said, we have a senator we won't mention. And I won't even say what district, but we have a senator that really isn't in to what we want. Can we support the, the Republican? Well, and, and we will Richard, not be. Said, Richard said, if you could do it quietly, but you girls are not very quiet. <laughs> so, well, for, for, fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, there was another uh, Democrat running right. against the sitting senator. Right. So that was uh, that helped. That helped. Yep. But he said, "You, you, you girls are not very quiet." He said, "If you can do it quietly, and I don't know about it, but you all <laughs> are not well, very one, quiet." Well, one, one of the things that should be added, I think, uh, about that is that um, once in a while, I appreciate uh, a Republican getting on the floor at the end of session and talking about some of the bills that really don't make a lot of sense. And we do have, on occasion, a bill that gets passed in the legislature that really um, shouldn't. Uh, yes. So, uh, on occasion, it's, not, it's good to have one or two voices of Republicans who are pointing out the uh, misadventures of the Democrats. Yeah, the, the failure to have a two-party system here actually weakens the Democratic Party. So the kinds of social divisions that are going to occur anyways are expressing themselves along lines of faction and other stuff that probably it would be better if they expressed themselves in different parties so that people can actually articulate their, their, their views with more freedom. It's difficult for a Democrat to speak out against some of the shenanigans of the de- yeah. other Democrats. Well, now we only have 30 seconds left. So let's go around real quick. Richard? I'm so proud to be here today with Tracy Takano and Bob Dan. Yeah, they Ticano. are two people who have lived the Democratic ideals. I'm just here because Marsha told me we we're going to say goodbye to Richard, so that's why. Oh. You know, Richard has done so much that, that he, he deserves this and more. Yeah. And, and let me say that when she invited me to be on, I said, no, no, no. The person you need to be, have in here is Tracy Takano. <laughs> you know? So yes. there's great aloha, and, and I haven't seen him for a while, and I'm very and glad to see him. And I haven't either. Here. So glad to see you. Nice to see you. And, but you're right. He did so much work that we don't, and it just sort of happened. We didn't know all that he was doing to make, make all of us here today. So, Richard? Again, we are so happy to have you. Thank you. And have enjoyed all the years we've spent with you. Thank you. And going back to the cold country, 
Well, at least it's a democratic state. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you're going to keep it that way. <laughs> yes. 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 Again, thank you all so much for doing this. Thank you, Master. Aloha. 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 And let me read this one last quote. Bart said, we are stewards of the party, not its owners. I love that. Of all the things you said, I kept that one. Okay. Yes. Aloha, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>